Welcome, St. John's, as we continue to look at women in the Bible. Today, we look at Eve. Whether you are familiar with women in the Bible or not, Eve is usually a familiar name to many, as she is often attributed to the downfall of humanity. I mean, if she only didn't eat that apple. Well, before we unpack that story, here are some announcements about upcoming events for the rest of the summer. If you are looking for something to do on a Saturday morning or need a reason to just even get out of bed, come on down to hand out groceries to our neighbors at 7.30 in the morning. It is a great way to start your day. And if you've been putting off buying your tickets, you only have a couple weeks to join St. John's and see the Giants play the Colorado Rockies on September 10th. Tickets are $27 and you can purchase them at stjohnssf.org slash giants and make sure you do so by August 10th. And lastly, it's that time of the year to do some cleaning, gardening, and organizing at the church. So join us August 26th to just tidy up the church before the fall season begins. All ages are welcome. We will have all different kinds of tasks available. And of course, your ongoing generosity allows St. John's to serve our community and our neighborhood. There are many different ways to give, whether it is online or mailing a check. And if you have a prayer request, you can easily send them to our prayer team who are committed to praying for you throughout the week. I also encourage you to join the prayer team. It is so simple. You will get a weekly email list of all the prayers, as well as a suggested prayer to prayer throughout the week. And it's a wonderful way to get to know our faith community. So now let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Let's open to ourselves to hear God's word. Let us worship God. Today's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 3. Listen to today's story. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman, Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, Don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. When the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized what she would get out of it, she knew everything. She took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he ate. Immediately, the two of them did see what's really going on, saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together as makeshift clothes for themselves. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called to the man, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from that tree I told you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you gave me as a companion, she gave me fruit from the tree. And yes, I ate it. God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The, the serpent seduced me, she said, and I ate. God told the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed, cursed beyond all cattle and wild animals, cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head 
you'll wound his heel. He told the woman, I'll multiply your pains in childbirth. You'll give birth to your babies in pain. You'll want to please your husband, but he'll lord it over you. He told the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from. Don't eat from this tree. The very ground is cursed because of you. Getting food from the ground will be as painful as having babies is for your wife. You'll be working in your pain all your life long. The ground will sprout thorns and weeds. You'll get your food the hard way, planting and tilling and harvesting, sweating in the fields from dawn to dusk until you return to that ground yourself. Dead and buried, you started out as dirt. You'll end up dirt. The man known as Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. God made leather clothing for Adam and his wife and dressed them. God said, the man has become like one of us, capable of knowing everything, ranging from good to evil. What if he now should reach out and take fruit from the tree of life and eat and live forever? Never, this cannot happen. So God expelled them from the Garden of Eden and sent them to work the ground, the same dirt out of which they'd been made. He threw them out of the garden and stationed angel cherubim and a revolving sword of fire east of it, guarding the path to the tree of life. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Imagine you are living in a perfect world where all you ever need or desire is provided. You have companions, beauty and purpose. You are seen, welcomed, and appreciated. I know what you're thinking. Teresa, you are describing Barbie Land. If you haven't seen the movie, the hype is all it's cracked up to be. Even if you weren't like me as a child who had the dream house, 12 Barbies, a Skipper, and a Ken doll, plus the pink Corvette, this movie really does speak to today's society. More than that, this is a Garden of Eden story. Barbie, in the midst of perfect hair, perfect outfit, and having a dance party with her perfect friends, she has an existential thought as she questions her own mortality, which leads her to question her own purpose, identity, and meaning to life. This doesn't only affect Barbie, but Ken also begins to question his life as well. This questioning awakens both Barbie and Ken to a reality that they didn't know if they were quite ready for. For the first time, they feel sadness, regret, loss, pain, inadequacy, self-doubt, embarrassment, and shame. The journey of self-discovery changes them in ways that enable them to see not only themselves differently, but also the world and their place in the world. Today, we read about a pivotal moment that happened in the Garden of Eden. To summarize, woman sees apple tree, snake tricks woman to eat from it, woman eats apple, woman tricks man to eat the apple, God gets mad, man blames woman, woman blames snake, all get punished and kicked out of the garden. Now, I would like to invite us to consider whether that is the story or the interpretation of the story that we have heard time and time again. I wanna give us permission to ask whether the snake is really crafty, whether the woman really did anything wrong, whether God was really mad, and whether they were really punished. And here's why this invitation to do so is important. It's because of what we know of Eve. Take a moment and ask yourself what you know of Eve. What words or images come to mind? For many of us, Eve is as conic as Barbie. Eve is portrayed as the first woman. She represents the entire female sex. Even though like Adam, she is created in God's image, she's considered the lesser of the two because she is created second and described as a helper. She is solely responsible for the fall of humanity and the reason why there is sin and suffering in the world. That is quite a heavy resume to place on one woman. 
Because of this one narrative, women for generations to come have had to pay the price for what Eve has done. Quintus Septimius Florence Tertullianus, an early Christian theologian who lived from 155 AD to 220 AD, called Eve the devil's gateway, the unsealer of that forbidden tree, the first deserter of the divine law who destroyed God's image, man. The consequences of such thinking have led to theological justification of centuries of persecution of women. The Salem witch trials in the 1600s, women's rights to choose, women's ability to work and lead, sexual harassment in the workplace, domestic violence, and the list goes on. In an essay in the book, Violence Against Women and Children, Charlie S. says, this mythic image justifies violence against the female for the sake of preserving the hierarchies which define patriarchal conceptions of order. Phyllis Tribble, a renowned feminist biblical scholar, says that the traditional interpretation of the Garden of Eden story is just an imaginative interpretation and speculation from male scholars that has been claimed as the only interpretation. Tribble points out the text itself doesn't say why the serpent speaks to the woman. I mean, why not speculate instead that the serpent questions her because she is the more intelligent of the two, or because she has a better understanding of the divine command, or because she is more independent? By contrast, it could be said that the man is silent, passive, bland, and belly-oriented, that he thinks with his stomach and not his brain. By liberating Eve from the traditional interpretations of this text, we are essentially liberating all, not just women. On October 30th, 1972, a group of women held a religious service to do just that, liberate the apple from the curse of the fall and to confess guilt in falling for a traditional male interpretation of the Eve and Adam story. In doing so, they were given apples to bite into as they read this affirmation. We affirm that the story does not convey truth to us about apples and certainly not about ourselves. With each bite, they ate not on behalf of Eve and not even on behalf of women, but as part of all humanity. In fact, they communally confessed. We hold that Eve performed the first free act of conscious personal choice. When reading the Garden of Eden story, have you ever wondered what was the real problem of Eve eating from that particular tree? I mean, was it only because God said so? And if that is the case, then really isn't God kind of a jerk for putting something like that in the garden in the first place? I mean, I was that kid that if you told me not to touch it, I'm going to touch it. I just am. What kind of a cruel God is that who plays with humanity like that, especially when the consequences is expulsion from the garden, pain and suffering, and eventually death? I mean, what happened to grace, forgiveness, or even just a second chance? Does that sound like the God you know or even want to believe in? Isn't it harder to believe that Eve's one act of biting an apple subjected the human race to pain, sickness, and despair so much so that God would eventually have to send God's son to atone for the sins of the world. Let's take a step back. The name of the tree that Adam and Eve are not to eat from is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. According to Eve, if they eat from that tree, they will die. And the snake tells Eve that she won't die, but she will be able to see clearly and know all things good and evil to which Eve chooses to see all things clearly. Have you ever had a moment where you saw someone clearly for the first time? Maybe that was someone who was a parent or a teacher or a mentor, someone you looked up to, someone who as a kid seemed to know it all and have all the answers. Then as we grew up, we realized they're just human. They make the same mistakes and the gloss has worn off on them a little. We have to reconcile with what we believed about them and now what we see in them. Or maybe it's a job. 
You believe there's a purpose to what you are doing or that your skills are valued, that you are valued, only to realize you're just as disposable or the company isn't what it seems or that there are politics at work. Or maybe it is the city we live in. San Francisco is wonderful in so many ways. Unlike other places, there are things we don't have to worry about, such as banning of books and human rights. But then you peel back some of the layers and you see the gap of who can afford to live here and work here. Or maybe it is us. You have an experience where you realize you aren't as woke as you thought you were. And therefore your actions have unintentionally or intentionally hurt others. Or you feel lost because your worldview has changed and you don't quite know how you fit in. Or maybe you can't pretend anymore that you are happy, everything is fine, and I can handle it. There are a couple moments in the Barbie movie when Barbie begins to see clearly. The first moment is when a thought about death pops into her brain. Here she is dancing her heart out in a synchronized dance routine with all her Barbie friends when she asks, has anyone thought about death? This very real question breaks through Barbie's perfect world where all of a sudden her breath stinks, her waffle is burnt. She falls instead of gently floating into her car and more importantly, her feet go flat. This leads her to go see Weird Barbie. Now Weird Barbie is what happens to a perfect Barbie when she is played with too rough. Weird Barbie gives Barbie a choice choose the heels and stay ignorant to how the real world works, or choose the Birkenstock and face the real world to get to the root cause of what is happening to her. Unlike Eve who ate that apple, Barbie reluctantly chooses to face the real world. The second moment is when Barbie returns to Barbie land and things are not as they should be. Barbie's identity is lost, she was built to have perfect hair, perfect looks, and a perfect body, but what good is that when her world is falling apart? And now, without giving away any spoilers, and with the help of her Barbie companions, she realizes the hard truth of what it is like living in the real world. And unfortunately, that comes with feeling sadness, regret, loss, pain, inadequacy, self-doubt, embarrassment, and shame. That's the evil part of it. But the good part, the good part is seeing yourself clearly that you are good enough just as you are. Or in the words of Ken, I'm enough. Good enough. That is the foundation of the creation story. That with each animal, plant, space, and person created, God declared it is good. If it is true that Eve performed the first free act of the personal choice, then we are also free to make choices we can choose to believe that we are good enough. Good enough to believe in ourselves, good enough to ask some good questions of the Bible and challenge our faith, good enough to love one another, good enough to be in relationship with one another, good enough to just be, and maybe, just maybe, good enough to help change the world. To do so, it may mean that we have to take a hard look at ourselves and one another. It may mean that sometimes in order to love each other, we may have to ask for forgiveness or forgive, keep each other accountable and be held accountable, hear hard truths and choose to change. It may mean we have to see the world clearly and not choose to ignore and be complacent or complicit in what is happening. Having knowledge of good and evil is a difficult choice, and God is right. You can die. Jesus did. And maybe God wanted to protect Adam and Eve just a little bit longer before making that choice, but it is also liberating. We can claim who we are and whose we are. We can choose that evil doesn't have the last word. We can delight in one another and cheer for one another. We can truly embrace how resilient we are. We can take back the narrative and open ourselves to the range of interpretations that will broaden our understanding of God. Maybe not everything does happen for a reason. Maybe life just sucks. 
but maybe I'm not alone in this and there are others who understand what I'm going through. Maybe faith isn't about rules and regulations, but it is actually a relationship filled with grace and liberation. And maybe we are all truly created equally beautiful in God's image, no matter what gender, race, sexuality, class, age, or status, because we are all God's children. That is something worth knowing about. That is something worth protecting. That is something worth believing. Eve may have started it all, but we continue to fill the pages. So may you go and color with all the colors of the rainbow and then some. Amen. I invite you to hear this prayer as a confession as well, as a desire to loosen our traditional names for God and consider the expansive image of who God is. Pray with me. Dear God, you are no more male than I am God, even though I have been well-trained and my instinct has always been to address you in the masculine. You are as much, no more, mother than father to me, and yet I still find father my instinctive address. You nurture me at your breast as I have nurtured my own children, and yes, I am more and less than your child. I am more willing to accept traditional masculine understandings of who you are than to explore new, more inclusive ways of thinking of you and by extension of myself as your creation. I forget that it is all of humanity who are your image and not man or woman. Teach me, O Lord, father, mother, lover, beloved, teach me to be open to all that you are. Teach me to hear you in the joyful voices of children, in the wisdom of the grandmother, in the bravado and confidence of the beardless youth, and in my own yearning for truth and meaning. Fill me, beloved, with the passionate and powerful desire to share your life and live only for you. Know me as only a lover can and make me exquisitely aware of your knowing and your love. Amen and go throughout your week knowing that God, God with so many names beyond our imagination, is with you giving you strength, claiming you as God's own, and know that you are more than good enough to be loved, to love, to be forgiven and forgive, to share in the compassion of God's embrace. Go in peace.